I will write the new law on their heart. I will be their God and they shall be my people. After generations of exile in Babylon, the people of Israel return home to a new promise. After a year of pandemic, of isolation and loss and anxiety, we must hold on to that same promise of restoration and healing. But before we put our hope and all our hope in a return to normalcy, whatever that means, let's consider what God is doing with us now while we're still in this place. To do that, let's imagine. Let's imagine that as the Israelites were finally settling back into their own home, old homeland, they were given a survey that asked just a single question. Which of these major changes, the exile or the return, had the greatest impact on your faith? Now, the years in exile had been a tragedy. They had lost their status, their security, their identity, and they'd lost the temple itself. Returning home meant the end of a dark time. And it also meant that exuberance that comes when pent-up energy can finally be channeled into the work of rebuilding. Now, both of these movements into exile and then returning home meant moving from one life to another one entirely. In exile, they had lost everything. And into that place of profound loss, Jeremiah gave them hope. God's fidelity to the covenant was still intact. Though the world had changed, God had not. And the days were surely coming when instead of a reckoning, they would experience return. Now, nobody wants reckoning. Everybody wants the, re the restoration. But I'd argue that in a certain way, they are remarkably similar things. Reckoning and restoration. You see, both represent profound change, and change can be holy. Sometimes change is instantaneous. It can be a catastrophe or a miracle. Sometimes it's imperceptible, tectonic in its pace, but moving along all the same. But if we take for granted that change will come, sometimes it's restoration, sometimes it's reckoning, sometimes it's just life, we can ask, which of these is better for our faith? Which, what kind of change can best help us to heal, to grow, to reach toward union with God? Which is better, exile or return, reckoning or restoration, decline or growth? If the Israelites were human, and I'm pretty sure they were human, they'd have answered with 99% certainty that the return was far better. And in many ways it is, but in some ways, not necessarily. I have a feeling that both are a profound opportunity to grow in spirit. Now, a year into the pandemic, I'm not looking here for a silver lining. I know what we've lost. I know that some of you have lost parents, siblings, and friends. I know that you've watched your children struggle with loneliness and remote school and a whole new baseline of stress that no one should grow up with. I know this has been deeply lonely. I know that much of this loss was preventable and that only compounds the grief. Yet I also believe that God has been with us in every moment amid the tears and the sadness, as well as the hopefulness that carries us today. God has been working in us, in the tender spaces of our hearts, planting new seeds of healing and belonging us that can carry us forward. 
I don't know what that change will mean. I don't know what it means in my life. I don't know what it means in your life. I don't know what it's going to mean for all of our lives. That's, that's really for the Holy Spirit to know. But I do know that God is here and has been here all along. You see, I believe that every change we experience, whether it's painful or it's hopeful or every point in between, every one is an invitation to reach towards God. And I don't think that's by accident. I think that's why change is a part of life. I think that every time our world shifts, there's a chance to rekindle, that every new normal, big air quotes there, is an invitation to revive and renew the, 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 cov the covenant of holiness that defines our lives. I'm not saying that every change is a winner. Sometimes they're great. Sometimes they really shouldn't happen. And sometimes they feel like death. In fact, our gospel goes a step further. Sometimes change is death. There's no point in denying it. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That's our vocation. To follow Jesus to the cross. To let the falsities of our lives die away, die off, and to be changed by that. And sometimes our vocation is to bear the pain of change that so many in our world struggle and can't handle. Because that's what Jesus did. The exile in Babylon was deeply painful. It was a humiliation that lasted for generations. But it wasn't such a bad thing for their relationship with God. Without the temple, they had to figure out who they were apart from an iconic identity. Without a king of their own, they saw the withered fruits of their own exceptionalism. They saw it with a clarity that they just couldn't have before. Suddenly brought low, they could see the toll that their greed had taken on their neighbors and on their own hearts. This was bad for their egos, but let's be honest, it wasn't so bad for their souls. The more, their mournful songs by the river of Babylon became hymns that would sustain them. The prophets who had warned of their downfall now used the same poetry to remind them that God grieved beside them. And Jeremiah knew that if they returned home and they put their feet up and they got all cozy and got to feeling good about themselves and began to forget once again what fidelity to the covenant meant, then they'd be headed for the same outcome all over again. Restoration would make it all better, but would it be good for their souls? Remember, though, that every time something shifts, there's an opportunity to go deeper. There's an invitation to go into that file cabinet and take out the covenant that God made with us, to renew it and even revive it as something with a living claim on our lives. Every change is a chance to grow in our relationship with God. So Jeremiah, so Jeremiah prophesied their return, but he added something new to the covenant. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We've heard that phrase before, but this is where we get it. From when the people of God return from exile, to, to a new return, a to, new place in their homeland. Everything was as they thought it was, except it just wasn't anymore. Even when we forget, 
we are God's. And God is with us. Even when we are lost, we are God's. Even when we are ecstatic with the joys of return, God remembers what we've lost and heals us in places that we can't even see. And unlike the old laws, laws that were written on stone, God will put the law within the people and will write it on their hearts. Not on stone, but on flesh, but flesh and blood. God wanted the people to make a leap, an upgrade, if you will, from one platform to another, from stone to flesh and blood. They weren't simply to be signatories to the new covenant. They were to be the covenant with the word imprinted on their hearts and their love of God evident through their very lives. Stone tablets may be good and sturdy, but stone doesn't grow and it doesn't respond well to change. Exile had taught them that stone can crumble or be struck down or simply wasn't packable when they had to move but that hearts bound together by prayer and songs and love were far more durable. And that may have surprised them. Where stone had failed, their hearts had held them. Their hearts in their very grief had held them. And their hearts would be the new vessels. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, it will not bear fruit. In this life, the winds will blow, the rains will come, the ground underneath us will collapse from time to time. But God is still God. The temple may fall into the abyss and take with it the stone or the scroll that holds the old law. But the new covenant has already been given. It is here. It's right here. The new covenant has been written on our hearts and we keep it with our lives. The changes in life may be swift and varied. The waters will rage and foam. So we fix our hearts on the presence and grace of God. As our world changes, we hold fast to, the, to a promise that does not change. God is with us. God is our refuge and strength, and we are God's people. We know this because it's written on our very hearts.